Just Baseball Show is presented by BetMGM. Use promo code Just Baseball. Start betting with the King of Sportsbooks. Happy August. Happy deadline day. We're recording on July 31. We're recording early afternoon. So don't be angry if a blockbuster goes down on Monday evening and we're not talking about it. We will talk about it on tomorrow's show. We will also talk about it on today's live show. We're going to be live on all of our platforms. Uh, probably best way to to follow along and comment with us is via YouTube. Um, just baseball on YouTube. We, we're going to be kind of breaking down the deadline as the deadline approaches. So five to six or a little after six, uh, we're going to be talking trade deadline. All three of us, Jack, Aram, Peter, you've got me, Jack, him, Aram here uh, on Tuesday's just baseball show. We're going to talk about the, this angels Rockies deal that went down, but a lot of what could be to come this clearly being a seller's market. Should the white Sox move cease? Should the Mets move Verlander? Should the white Sox move Luis Robert? Also want to revisit the Scherzer deal and the David Robertson to Miami deal uh, with Aram. So we've got some shit going down, man. You you kind of wanted to unplug, I think, at the lake, hmm. but not the case for deadline. Uh, week. I, I, well, first of all, I'm still processing that you just called me him. Um, so I appreciate that. Got um, you. Yeah. I, I meant it lowercase h, not capital. Oh, uh, it was, it was a, yeah, it's all right. I, I heard what I wanted to hear. Um, got you. Now, I, I knew what I was signing up for when... Uh, when the girlfriend was like, Hey, you know, you want to go out to, to the lake? Cause it just worked out in terms of the national, you know, I was out there buying, selling some cards, doing stuff with sponsors out here in Chicago. Um, and, and her family's from here. And so it's like, Oh, we can go from there to, to the lake. And I was like, Oh, great. When would that be again? And she's like, Oh, J- July 31st, August 1st time. I'm like, Oh no. <laughs> uh, but no, it works. I was just like, all right, first two days, I'm going to be heads going to be in the laptop and I'm going to be recording a lot. And then, we're coasting on the back half. So just grinding it out, having fun, enjoying the deadline. I hope they give us some fireworks because y- you have to be attentive. You have to be plugged in because trades will be made. But if if I have to be attentive and then they're also not that exciting, I'm going to be pissed. I will mm-hmm. say like we were talking about how this is going to be a subdued deadline. I think it's been a little bit like exciting enough so far. Like we obviously are waiting for a, a few of the main, main, main you know shoes to drop. But there's been a little bit of excitement so far. Like, it hasn't been a total flop. And uh, there's been more than enough to talk about and some good rumors. And, again, I think I think we're going to see, and we'll, we'll briefly touch on it. Like, I said off the top that or before we recorded that I didn't want to talk about Verdugo, like, f- rumors, whatever. But the more I think about it, it's an example of big leaguer for big leaguer type deals. Like, this just might be one of those instances where, you know, we might get some surprise big leaguer for big leaguer trades that we had no idea about. Because teams don't like to let people know that they're shopping guys. Like I'm sure that Heim Bloom is not thrilled that it got out that they are listening on Verdugo because that's not something you want Verdugo to hear when you're two and a game, two and a half games out of the wild card. Yeah, no, a hundred percent, man. I, I think you're spot on there. Um, I also think like I don't. You said we're waiting for the main shoes to drop. You know, I say who are those main shoes that we were expecting that haven't dropped yet? Like Eduardo Rodriguez, Jamer Candelario, I think. But we know yes. that Shohei's off the market. We know that Bellinger is off the market. You have to assume if Belly's off the market, Marcus Stroman is off the market too. So the rentals that everybody ID'd aren't going anywhere. So it's Candelario, Erod. After that, we're going to get a little creative. We didn't think Scherzer was on the move until like two days ago. And now Scherzer is on a different team. Looks yeah. like Verlander might be on a different team too. So the three guys that I want to mention here are Verlander, Cease, and Luis Robert. But before we get to that conversation, let's revisit David Robertson going from the Mets to Miami and then Scherzer going from the Mets to Texas. Let's start with David Robertson. It was Ronald yeah. Hernandez, a catcher, and Marco Vargas, who's an advanced bat uh, for David Robertson. That's a, I mean, it's a fortifying move for the back of that pen, especially with Puck struggling, but you thought that might've been a bit of an overpay? In a vacuum, yeah. You know, it, I think it's a, it's it's going to be an iffy move in hindsight if they don't do anything else. And my issue with it was, this is a, a weird market. And I, I don't think, and Craig Mish has made this clear too. Miami Herald, uh, he does an unbelievable job. And Craig Mish, you know, he's plugged in with the Marlins. He said, if they don't get a bat, it's not for a matter of not trying. And that sounds silly because it's like, if you just, what do you mean try? Just go get the bat. Yeah. But the, the Nationals are in a spot, and Mike Rizzo said this, where they get to pick from the litter of who they want for Heimer Candelario because everybody wants him. Everybody wants him. So if you don't have something that you can offer, 
that really makes Candelario, a, a, you know, a, a no brainer for your team. Like if the nationals say, Hey, we prefer the prospects that other teams can offer. You can't get Candelario. So I thought it was interesting to part with one of your best position player prospects for, you know, for a, a reliever. If you might not be, be able to get the bats. Cause without the bats, this team is, is not a playoff team. That said, Robertson shut the door in a game that they really needed literally yesterday. And it was the most, calming ninth inning I've seen on a Marlins game in some time. So, you know, it, it definitely makes sense quickly on Vargas. I, I think he's one of the better position player prospects they had to offer, which I know isn't saying much, but I, I do think he has top 100 upside by late this year, early next year. I, of course you have all the national writers and the Mets beat writers and whatever, just looking at pipeline and saying, Oh, Marco Vargas is only 21 in the, in the system and whatever. Ask any scout, ask any evaluator, Marco Vargas is is closer to a top 100 prospect than he is to the back of the Marlins top 30. It's just a preseason list on an 18 year old who has really showed out at the complex this year and has showed some things that you know I think people did not you know think he had in there. That's what happens every year. That's how prospects get identified. That's how the Mets lost so many good prospects through the years. Like I'm, I hate when they just when folks go to pipeline and make a sweeping decision on a trade on guys that they've never seen. I promise you, Marco Vargas, Ronald Hernandez are good prospects and the Mets did well here, but for the Marlins, they needed to do it. They needed to be aggressive. If there's more moves to come, I'm here for it. And and I think you saw that with the White Sox too. People immediately assumed that it was a fleece job by the White Sox for Edgar Caro and Kai Bush. And Carroll was like every bit the part really of the number two prospect in yeah. the Angels system. But like Kai Bush was not the number three prospect in the Angels system. He wasn't close to that mark. No. Um, you know, kind of same deal with Corey Lee. Like, I think Corey Lee was still a top five prospect in the Astro system. No, he's not. So yeah. you have to kind of understand and palette who these guys are. And I think the best thing you can do is just go to their baseball reference page. Like, just look at what they've done recently yeah. because, I mean, we just talked about this on the call up. Prospects, minor league baseball is more of a what have you done for me lately game than anything else in this sport. Yeah. A guy can become a top one, top 100 prospect in a year, a la Chorio. They can also fall from top 50 outside the top 100, like a Nick York in Boston, but he's back now. Um, yeah. David Robertson. I, I thought you were going to say Zach Veen. V, no, Veen is still top one for me. Yeah. Yeah. My top 100, Zach Veen one. <laughs> Yankee yes. Fernandez too. It's just like Rockies one through seven, and then everybody yeah. else kind of follows. Everybody else. Yeah. yeah um, how much money do you think David Robertson has made in his big league career? Ooh, I did. He's played in some big markets. I, I I forget what what game I was, what TV broadcast I was watching, but everyone talking about how he's played for both Chicago teams, both New York teams, I think both Florida teams. That's not a big market, but I'm gonna go with sixty mil. David Robertson has made ninety three million dollars. Good for him. He's been going at it for a long time, man. He debuted at 23 years old in 2008, 2009. This guy got Cy Young votes or 2011. Pardon. This guy got Cy Young votes. 2009. He was the setup man for Mariano Rivera and had a low threes. He had a low threes. Then he got a high threes. And Wait, then the cutter. Yeah. And, and 66 and two thirds in 2011 as a 26 year old, eight earned runs. It's a 108 ERA. He was an all-star. He was 11th Cy Young voting. He got a couple of, like low down the ballot MVP votes. That was 2011, man. That was 12 years ago. And now here he is making $10 million. So good on David Robertson for yeah. continuing to keep on keeping on at 38 years old. Um, Scherzer's 39. Scherzer has shown his age a bit more than David Robertson. Peter and I spent a lot of time talking about this. It was Scherzer. Texas is going to pay Scherzer 22.5 through the remainder of that contract. He opted in for next year. So they get, two playoff runs with Max Scherzer in their rotation for Luis on Helicuna. And the Mets are going to pay about $30 million to Texas for Luis on Helicuna. We spent some time on, uh, on Acuna. Um, you know, we mentioned he's not the carbon copy of his brother. That's 21 no. years old. Um, no. he, he doesn't have the juice. You know, we, we had the Ozzy Albies conversation. Like, I don't think, he doesn't have the power that Albies does. Like we mentioned, Albies is kind of 30 and 100. Like that's never going to be Acuna, but Acuna is faster. Albies probably has a little bit better bat to ball in terms of like lack of K rate, but Acuna is good in that department. And Acuna 
is a really good shortstop. I, I love the defense at short. I love the defense all over the infield. He started to see action in center. I, he's just like above average tools across the board, elite base dealer. He's a really good prospect, a top 100 guy, and it was a good get, but they, they paid a lot of money to be able to get him. Yes. I mean, Max Scherzer, so it's what, you're getting him for a year and in, in a quarter? The way to look at it is like they basically signed Max Scherzer. Of course, you're getting him for a rental this year and then signed him next year for like what, one year? Like almost a qualifying 22. offer. 22.5. They basically signed him for like the qual less than the qualifying offer for next year. Like that's pretty absurd. I, I know Scherzer's a, a a shell of himself, and and there's two sides to it. Like I think the Mets did really well to to get a Luis on Helicuna and money ain't a thing. But I'll get the Rangers side. Yeah, you, know, you don't you're not going to lose sleep over trading in Acuna to to get a Max Scherzer that you hope you get more out of. But I, am I the only one that's worried about this Rangers rotation still a little bit? Like I know that they're doing everything they need to do. They get a Scherzer, they get a Jamon. Like they're they're getting guys, but Ivaldi might not pitch again this year, which would suck. But like you know, forearm strain after double TJ, like that's scary. Um, and then you you look at the rest of the rotation, like Heaney, Perez, like those guys haven't been good. So okay, who's your ace? John Gray. Yeah. Dane Dunning is the best statistically. I like, mean, shit, like, playoff series. Evaldi's unavailable. I think this is the this is the doomsday scenario, but I think it's a very feasible doomsday scenario. Yeah. Scherzer continues to struggle, and Evaldi's unavailable. What's your playoff rotation? Do you have to put Scherzer in because he's a Hall of Famer, even if he's getting whacked? I think so, uh, and I think this is where Peter you and I kind of. I know. I I think Peter and I kind of butted heads here because he said he would rather have Jordan Montgomery than Scherzer, and I immediately and and I know that you. You're not like totally team Peter, but you're not team Jack in that conversation either. Like it, it's, it's a conversation. I was quick to shut down the conversation because I was like, it's fucking Max Scherzer, dude. Like we can't do this, but he hasn't been good this year. So you're running out, you know, a Scherzer that's getting hit around the ballpark, a Jordan Montgomery, who's not a playoff one. You're not winning a playoff series with Jordan Montgomery as your one. I'll say that right now. And John Gray, who, yes, has been solid, but solid looks like a, a low three. Solid doesn't look like a sub two in the playoffs, and he puts you on his back. Yeah. So that's where I'm at. I, again, they're doing everything they need to do. And I think they're a really good baseball team. And, you know, hopefully they get Seeger back and, you know, relatively soon and, and everything else comes together. But the underlying numbers on John Gray aren't great. Usually those rear their heads in the playoffs if you get through the whole regular season with you know some iffy underlying numbers i'm just worried about the, the playoff rotation they really need evaldi maybe that's why they shut him down just to make sure that he can throw in the playoffs and maybe hopefully it's not as bad of a forearm strain uh but again this was not not much to give up to get max scherzer what else was really out there so i think in a vacuum the rangers did a good thing here to improve the rotation. I think Scherzer does that regardless. And at the end of the day, let's get to the playoffs first. I know that they look like they have a great chance in doing so, but you want to win that division. You're only one game up on the Astros. Scherzer will help you do that by at least you're hoping, give you a quality start, you know, every fifth day or something close to it and give you flashes. You hope that in the playoffs, he unlocks another gear and also just having Scherzer in the fold. Now you can maybe skip a start here and there. You can keep him healthy. You can keep him right physically. Uh, so that, you know, that's the goal. And he's coming off of one of his better starts of the year against the Nationals. And, and two of his last three starts have been you know, pretty darn good. One iffy start sandwiched in between in Boston, but bad, bad place to pitch. And, and they've been just really on fire lately. So good pickup regardless. And you're not losing sleep over Acuna. I think this was a win for both sides, uh, all things considered. Yeah. Um. All right. I, I do want to jump into – the, the newest reports about huge, huge names that could be available before we end, you know, it, it's like a soft landing with Alex Verdugo and, and Adam Duvall. But um, we are going to talk Cease, Luis Robert, Justin Verlander right now. But before that, a uh, reminder that our friends at Homage have an excellent promo offer going for you right now. Um, if you go to homage.com, H-O-M-A-G-E.com, it is, I mean, the highest quality apparel that you will find in terms of like novelty tees. With baseball, you'll get retro of your favorite team. I mean, shit, you want MLB Jam, NBA Jam stuff? You can get non-baseball stuff on there. Just go look at homage.com. Guarantee you, you're going to like something. Put something in your cart. 
And at checkout, use promo code JUSTBASEBALL20. JUSTBASEBALL20 means 20% off your entire order. No minimum spend required. You get a shirt. You get eight shirts. You get 10 hoodies. You get 20% off. It will not stack with other site-wide promotions that you may find. Available new customers only. Limit one use per customer. It is active through August 7th. Uh, go hit up our friends at Homage. They have some great stuff coming out at all times. Love it. Jump into Cease and Robert. Ken Rosenthal said that the White Sox are apparently listening on absolutely everybody now. And we are a couple days removed from the White Sox saying that they are not listening on Dylan Cease. Do you think they're changing their mind because this is so clearly a seller's market? Yes, I think so. And I also think like, I think it was a little bit of posturing. How could you not listen on Dylan Cease? And we've talked about it. This team's not going to be good in the next two years. Dylan Cease will be a free agent you know, two years after this one. W what are you going to get out of Dylan Cease? And also, I think he's going to pitch better. Some people might say, oh, you're selling low because he's not pitching to the best of his ability. A year of control is is just as important as, as a whole run on your ERA to these teams. So, yeah, if he pitches next year and, you know, cuts the ERA down, you know, a decent bit and looks better, how much more is the return going to be than when he has two years and change of control and still shows flashes of the guy that was, you know, is not even a year removed from being the, the one of the Cy Young finalists. To me, it's a no brainer. You got to cash in and you can get the hall of all halls because most teams are seeing the price and they're like, I don't want to give up one of our main guys for a rental, but they could definitely talk themselves into overpaying for a Dylan Cease. Yeah, I, I think this could almost be a heat check trade and it's going to go well for Rick Hahn if he does move oh, yeah. Dylan Cease, I think. Like this is, damn, like this is what I got for Giolito. This is what I got for Kendall Graveman. I got a former first round pick catcher. This is what I got for Lance Lynn and Joe Kett. Let's, let's put this shit to the test, man. If they got crazy, Luis Robert is in that conversation too. I view that as 0.1%. Zero per, zero yeah. Mm-hmm. That but, guy is like that's Soto type haul for Luis Robert, especially yeah, with the discount it, he's on. And and that's the thing though, like he's around till when twenty twenty nine. I think so. Let let me pull up the exact numbers because not only is it a long time, but it's also dirt cheap. Luis Robert, let's see, this year he's making nine point five, twelve point five next year, fifteen the year after that. Club options for twenty in 2026 and 2027 that and takes him through his age 29 season this is an incredible contract yeah so how many years that was five more years of control uh through 27 so 24 25 26 27 it'd be it'd be five postseasons you get him for so you hope that you're good by that that's one that you can say hey you know that's a piece of our future we, we want to hold him cease is less than half of that right so it, that's where I'm at is that you're not turning this thing around by the time he sits free agency. You hopefully will just turn this thing around by the time Luis Robert would hit free agency. So keep Robert use him as that, that backbone of this, of this reshuffling, if you don't want to call it a rebuild. And and then from there, it, you can cash in on cease and get a lot of pieces to me. It's a no brainer to move cease. I, I, I think it would be a mistake not to. So here's the counter argument. And this is uh, my guy, Sean Anderson, who used to be a producer at 670 The Score, now with CHGO, who's doing a great job with White Sox, Cubs coverage, all that stuff in Chicago. <laughs> he tweeted, Michael Kopech looks extremely poised and confident enough to be the ace of this staff for the years to come. Trading Cease now while his value is the highest makes too much sense, especially with the bevy of young arms Sox have waiting in the wings. And then he lists the rotation uh, one Kopeck, two shrug emoji, three Tuki, four shrug emoji, five shrug emoji. It's a good point. Like the Sox, obviously, you went and you just got Nestrini. You went and you know you just got Kai Bush. Like Noah Schultz could rise quickly, but like there ain't much. So okay, you keep Cease for the next two years. Congratulations, your rotation is slightly less miserable. Now you won 70 games for two years and then you have a comp pick or you flip him for less as a rental. Like I, I just, that's where I don't understand that. I, like I hear it and I'm like, okay, yeah, it's going to be real ugly rotationally, but how, how do you fix that? One is by accumulating assets. 
And if you trade Dylan Cease, you can get a good pitching prospect or two along with some really good position player prospects. If you stockpile, spot, stockpile position player prospects, you can eventually convert that into starting pitching. I, I, it, cool. You have Cease for two years. That'll be really – that'll make the White Sox much more tolerable uh, for 2024 and 2025. I, that to me is – I'd rather watch two key two, five Tuki Toussaints over the next two years than keep Dylan Cease and have not much to show stuck. for him afterwards if it means I get a haul of all hauls for him this year with a bunch of guys that can come up and make a difference. Like Cease can get you franchise altering haul. That's the, the phrase, phrase I always want to use for those types of guys. You can alter your franchise with a Dylan Cease trade now. Yeah. I don't know if you can next year. What if he pitches exactly like this next year? And has one less year of control. Root. You're getting a like half, if that, because now he's even further removed from the Cy Young runner up. He's has less control and you're less c- confident that he can bounce back. You could just call this an outlier right now. Say, Hey, you know, everyone's been sucking in Chicago. It's, it's, it's a wasteland. Look at Tim Anderson. Just no one wants to play there right now. And, or, you know, you could wait and say, okay, what's the excuse now we have, 400 bad innings of Dylan Cease. So to yeah. me, it's cash in now and don't overthink it. Yeah. Um, throwing the tinfoil hat back on. And I read this on yesterday's show, but I want your take on it because I think your take will probably be similar to what I took away from this. This is from Astros GM Dana Brown. And I know that we talked about Cease and the Astros being a good partner. Quote, we would like to do a couple more things if we could, talking about the deadline, if it makes sense price tag wise. As I said, I really wouldn't want to give up the farm because we still have to have sustainable winning here. If there's a deal that makes sense, maybe improving the back end of our bullpen a little bit more. Our guys are a little taxed because we've had some starters that have gone down. If we can improve in that area, it would be fan- it would be outstanding. Right now, we're not in the market for a starter, but if something comes available that makes sense, we may jump on it. And Peter viewed that as total smokescreen. I viewed that as not in the market for a rental pitcher. They Mm -hmm. could be in the market for one of the most talented pitchers in baseball. I mean, good organizations that, you know, don't have an elite farm. They understand that the the, the price to pay for a rental is, is twofold. If if you're, if you're going to get a rental starters though. So I think for the Astros, that would stink for them to, to give up some, some quality pieces for a rental because while their system is much better than I think they get credit for, it's still not elite. You know, you're, you're, you're definitely setting yourself back a little bit for a rental. I think it's what you said. I'm only making a move if it's a player that helps us this year, next year, and maybe the year after that, or at least this year, next year, we can give up the farm for that because that's still sustainable winning rentals. Don't help you win sustainably farm system does control does. So yeah, I I take the same, you know, the same kind of uh, idea from that too. Got you. Um, Justin Verlander is good as gone. I think so, man. I think so. Also, he's throwing way better. I think people are kind of lumping Scherzer and Verlander together, and I don't think they should. No. I think Verlander has been far better, uh, especially of late. I think he's got a sub two over his last six starts. He's had way less physical ailments. Like, wouldn't you much rather have Scherzer or much rather have Verlander than Scherzer? Dude, Verlander's a year removed, less than a year removed from a Cy Young, and he's got a 3 1 in 94 innings. People just immediately assume that both these guys are in the high fours. Not, not the case. Scherzer is a little over four, but Verlander's a 3 1 5 in 16 yeah. starts. It's good. Yeah, like, that's very good. <laughs> Let's acknowledge that good. this is the best rental on the market. Yeah, it's actually funny that that's and it's not. It might not even be a rental if it, if you can work out something similar where player option, you can yep. get him to opt in. Um. So yeah, actually, let, let me pull. I just pulled his last seven starts. He's got a one four nine. Like the underlying numbers over that those last seven starts is closer to like a three, but still he's got a one four nine, and I'm I'm trusting Furlander to be able to you know out pitch his peripherals pretty consistently. It's not a rental. It's forty three next year too. And then it's a so, vested option. It turns into a player option if he throws 140 innings next year. Interesting. So this is a lot more than like a rental and you're hoping that you work out more. Like you're on the hook for yeah, about there's some complications. Yeah. There's some complications to it. But I, I think if they could get that Scherzer thing to work, I think they could get the Verlander thing to work. But on the flip side, the Mets aren't totally looking to reset. And they could probably make the case that Verlander helps them be competitive next year and the year after that. 
it's an interesting spot. I think you have to to float it around, see what's out there, because I think you could get a, a, a pretty good prospect return. But 140 innings is a pretty low bar. Like he could he could really struggle next year, hit 140 innings, and now you're on the hook for another another you know big year uh, money now, wise. That that's on that's unfortunately why I have to put the Reds thing to bed. I think oh. a lot of reports are saying that the Reds are interested in acquiring Justin Verlander. They can't afford that. Let's be unless frank. unless the Mets literally said we'll eat it, but then you know the the, the Reds would have to part with prospects that they don't want to part with. I, I, there's no way I'd put that to bed too. I agree. So be, I think it needs Dodgers, to be a big market. It'd be Dodgers. It'd be Maybe the Astros could reunite with him. I don't. I don't know how that ended. Um, maybe there's a world there. How many teams out there can really pallet? Even and I think money's getting eaten no matter what. Like the Orioles, they could theoretically do it. I think with if the money made sense and they could give up enough prospects and then I think to where Steve Cohen will just go on pipeline and see and be like. All right, fuck it. Let's let's give him a hundred M's. Like let's get, <laughs> give us Westberg. Give a yeah. Give us Ortiz. Like fuck it. Um, you know, or curse that. Like I could see them just be like it, they'll throw whatever the money is and to to get a couple of any of those guys. But who else out there, man? Like who else could really do it? Who can stomach that much money? I mean, the Yankees aren't going to do it, and the Yankees are already like flirting with the with the tax. I think the Dodgers are the perfect partner here. Like perfect the, partner. The Phillies, but they don't like desperately need a Verlander. No. And like, they're already spending. They're not, you're not trading in division. You're not going to, you're not going to, you're not going to give them pieces that, you know, could make a difference. Like the Mets desperately need pitching. You're not going to give them, you're not going to help them with Mick Abel. Uh, you know, yeah, but, there's no one but, else out there. Really? It's it, giants could, could kind of nestle their way in there. Maybe that's could, one that I think is underrated. The D backs have shown a willingness to spend. Not going to do it. it. It could, yeah. Uh, th- that could be one. That's a sneaky one. That's a the, sneaky one. The Angels don't have the capital to do The Angels, no, no, the Angels don't like have the capital. every cent of that. Yeah. The D backs could, could kind of do a nice little hybrid here. Like they're willing to pay half of it and could give the prospects to get money kicked in. I think the D backs are a sneaky one. Okay. And they need a shot in the butt. I just don't know anybody else that would do it. Giants, Dodgers, D-backs. Pickens are slim. Yep. But depending on how much money Uncle Steve's willing to eat, though, the the the, 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 the you can cast a wider net. So uh, it'll be interesting to see. But No, man, let's get that Silicon Valley money going. Justin Verlander, yeah, I, San Francisco Giant. They should trade him, though. They should. Because it just allows him to reshuffle the assets a little bit and – and maybe make a push at Otani because they're still saving some money. You know, they still yeah. are saving some. Make yeah. a push at Otani in the offseason. You know he's all over that. 100%. 100%. All right. Uh, let's wrap with Verdugo and Duvall in the Red Sox outfield. There was a report that, that came down from Chris Cotillo that the Red Sox are actively listening on outfielders. They already moved Kike Hernandez, who was kind of pigeonholed into playing a lot of short. Um, and apparently they are open to conversations regarding Alex Verdugo. Verdugo was having a really solid year. Then he stunk it up in July. That plummeted the numbers that I think a lot of people want to look at and say, hey, Verdugo is having this great year. Um, Alex Verdugo is a great defender. Alex Verdugo can be a great bat to ball guy. But Alex Verdugo's ceiling is limited. He's he's a 107 WRC plus right now. His ceiling is probably in the 120 range. Um, they love what they've gotten from Jaron Duran. Masataka Yoshida looks like a great pickup. And we were just talking about it before we hit record. Sedan Rafaela looks really good in his first couple of games in triple too. I think that might be their outfield trio moving forward, which in turn creates expendability for both Duvall and Verdugo. Yeah, you know, it's funny. I, I I think people might see that and be like, well, what, you're two and a half games out. What are you doing? What are you doing? Again, though, you, you see the market here. You might be able to turn Verdugo into pitching help for this year and beyond. Yeah. Uh, this is a unique situation where, you know, that that depth arm that might be blocked on another team could really help you. Um, and, and you can kind of put something together here. So 
Verdugo is Verdugo. That's the thing is I think in the first half of this year, people were like, oh, finally, Verdugo is taking that. He's a 107 WRC plus with good defense every year. That's a good, very good major league baseball player. A very good one. But Verdugo is Verdugo. And I think when you look at the rest of your team, you just laid it out. Yoshida has a chance to be a special bat for a while now. I know he's 30, but to do what he's done in his first year is amazing. Jaron Duran, as you mentioned, like this guy has had a, just an unbelievable like kumbaya season and he looks like he's here to stay and then they've got guys in the system too jack that i think are going to get up here quick they may be presumably far uh, but beyond rafaela uh, you've got roman anthony who looks like one of the best outfield prospects in the game now and could yeah. be up by you know late next year with the way he's playing uh, you've got outfield depth now starting to build up there uh, yeah you 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 could comfortably comfortably move him um, Duvall, you know, I, I would only do it if it made sense. I think you got to move one or the other. I think moving both would really wave the white flag on this season. Yeah. I think that would be weird to move both, right? And they don't want to do that. Yeah. Yeah. And Ref Snyder, by the way, too, like he's he's an overlooked guy. He is a great platoon bat. He's a really good platoon bat. If you look at his numbers from the start of last year, What's he the lefty? demolishes lefties. He's a fine defense, like he's passable in the outfield. That's another decent. Like if you trade Duvall and play Ref Snyder a little bit more again, especially against lefties, I don't think it's that big of a drop off. Like they've got depth in the outfield. I, I would, I would definitely consider cashing in on, on uh, Verdugo if it gets me pitching help. And I think there's a lot of teams out there that would want. Like think about like let's say you trade with the Twins. It would be larger than this, but Louis Varlin would go a long way for the Boston Red Sox. Mm-hmm. He would. So with David Festa, he might be the best pitching prospect. Like uh, Louis Varland, he's a high fours guy to this point, but he's better than that. I think he's going to keep getting better. He probably slides right into their rotation right now and helps them right now. So like, that's just one, one example off the top of my head. There's moves out there that I think could help them now and beyond for a guy that has been begging them to, to extend, uh, extend him in Verdugo. And they're just clearly not going to off the dome. Varland, Festa, and Walner for Verdugo. I think that oh, that's a lot. Yeah, but this is a seller's market, man. That's a lot. They they can attach something on top of that, and I think it's a deal. Like I think Verdugo and like a lower level piece or something else or a, I don't know something. And, else. and Walner fills a job for them. Walner is a big power bat that can slot into the middle of the order and and listen yep. like. Casas is not a 35% K rate guy. Walner is. So like you have a spot for a 35% yeah. K rate guy. If you, if you want, I, I wouldn't want it, but some people do. Yeah. No, I mean, then with the power it's, it's there. Um, not, Like that's just something that, that could be there. So I, I'm here for it. I just think it's funny because Red Sox fans were saying like, you know, Verdugo is, you know, hitting his, his all-star, uh, his all-star gear this sure. year. And, and welcome this back is why we Earth, traded but... Mookie Betts. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but no, the Red Sox are playing unbelievable ball. So, you know, I don't think you make a trade just to trade, Yeah. but they're not going to trade from the farm because why would you? you, you're trying to build sustainable success similar to some of the other teams and the farm's finally good or pretty good. Verdugo is a guy that's going to be off the roster relatively soon. Anyways, if you turn that into pitching, that helps you now and later. I, I love it. I think that would be a great move by Bloom. Yeah. Um, all right. Last thing. Dylan Carlson to Baltimore. <laughs> Your thoughts. That was floated. There were conversations apparently between Baltimore and St. Louis centered around Dylan Carlson. And you're shrugging. You look angry. And I think the way that I can put your facial expressions into words is why there's no space for Dylan Carlson. I get it right now because Kowser's not, you know, an everyday playoff center fielder. He's getting acclimated to the big leagues as many rookies do. Mullins is hurt. And it looks like, you know, to me that tips the hand that Mullins is going to be out longer. Right. Like, is it, does not, isn't that kind of what that tells you that they're worried about Mullins health. That's totally. What Hayes that. is corner guy. A lot of their guys are corner guys. I get it. I get it. But that's not like that's not gonna. If, if Kowser plays center field and hits two ten, I still think that they're really good. A, a pitching would go much further 
and but maybe the pitching's not out there and they want to lean into defense and and the offense i don't know it just made me pissed because i'm like that's like that's what you're looking for right now don't do i'd that. rather throw i'd rather throw a heston kerstad out there in center field and just let him run if it means i can cash my assets for a pitcher because here's the thing is carlson is as you know slightly above average as he has been in his big league career and it's like very slightly yeah not coming cheap it's multiple years of control he's 24 he makeups off the charts people love him like love him in the clubhouse he's a switch hitting good defender and center who's young with control even with a 105 wrc plus or whatever it is the day you check in on it he's not coming cheap and for an organization that wants to clutch their assets why would you cash him in on a on a guy that by next year will be useless. I I can see them helping them this year for a little bit, but next year you don't need them at all. Why would they do that? I have no idea, I, especially after what just happened in regards to Tyler Wells. Tyler Wells had a 3-1 ERA going into the break. After the break, he makes three starts. He throws nine innings, 10 hits, 11 earned. 11 earned in nine innings. They optioned him to double A. They gave him the Yuri treatment, even though Yuri never struggled. But they were like, "Oh, it's to manage his workload, right?" Dude, like, I I don't know. This almost feels like performance pace. <laughs> like, I, it's it's so odd what's going on here. So, I mean, Tyler Wells was the best pitcher for the Baltimore Orioles in the front half, and it wasn't close. And the fact that yeah. your best pitcher of the front half is now in Double A, and we're not talking about going to get starting pitching. What's going on here? with Carlson of all like I think the only thing that would have sent me further is if they went out for like like, we want Verdugo (laughs) no or Verdugo oh Verdugo but if they're like oh we we need a shortstop we're on the we're in the market for For sure I'd be like oh my god for like, sure. They checked in on Tim Anderson. I'd like lose my mind. Dude, but, I would love that because that would just be John Angelos. Like, what are you doing, brother? Yeah. Or I guess Mike Elias, what are you doing, brother? Um, and Mike Elias has proven to be unbelievable developing talent. And the yeah. Orioles have turned into like a Dodgers level factory over the last couple of years in terms of, of development, identification, and, and just getting these guys to, to turn into really good prospects. But we have not really seen Mike Elias cook in the next gear, which is build a big league team and cash in some assets to, you know, push a team over the top. And and they they kind of said that there it's heard in the ESPN broadcast yesterday, they kept showing them on the phone, which was so funny. And John Angelos is on the phone. Who, who's he on the phone with his accountant? Hey, can we, can we, can we spend this? And like, yes, John, you can spend whatever you want. We keep telling you that. And like, I don't know. Like who's he on the phone with? My law office is two blocks away from Camden yards, man. Fucking go to the postseason. (laughs) Yeah. Like, please. But you know, I, I think that this is one of those where it's like, you look at Elias, he's built the talent. He stockpiled it. He And they, they kind of said, the team's done their job. Now we need to do ours. Meaning like they've performed. Now we need to you know put them over the top. And we haven't seen Elias do it yet. I'm not saying he can't. I'm just really excited to see what a buying Elias looks like because so far he's just been so careful. Easton Lucas for Shintaro Fujinami looks like a really good deal, but that's not a buying Elias. I want to see Elias get aggressive. And I know they're like, oh, we're looking at the long-term plan. And I was curious what you, to wrap up, but this is something I wanted your thoughts on. Cause I was thinking about this when I was watching the game last night and they're like, they feel like this team could be good for a long time. Agreed. And they're looking at it that they're ahead of schedule this year. That's the term I keep hearing ahead of schedule. The The Cardinals or excuse me, the, the Reds are ahead of schedule. To me, the Orioles are a really good baseball team right now. Y- yes. You presume that you'll be better next year. But what if, Ad- God forbid, Ad- Adley Rutschman gets hurt? God forbid, uh, you know, Austin Hayes doesn't play as well. Uh, you know, maybe somebody else isn't as available. Like, maybe things don't go- come together as well as they did this year. I don't know if I totally agree with that mentality of just because we're young and it's our first year of being good, that will automatically be this good next year. It, look at the Padres. I know it's a different situation, but like from what la- they did last year to this year, like, oh, they get Tatis back. They're going to be great. They made additions. They're way worse. I don't think you can take for granted 162 games going the way you think they are, even if you're extremely talented. We're future focused. Like, I think us of too. And, and that is, you know, it's not a flaw because like, hey, it's really good. And we found a niche audience with that. But I, if nothing beats the here and now. Nothing. Mm-hmm. Like, if your team can win the World Series in 2023, 
like I, I'm going in on that as opposed to, hey, you either have a great chance to win the World Series this year or you have a slightly lower chance to win the World Series for a three year window after this. Yeah. Do you know how fucking valuable World Series? Like the Texas Rangers have never won one. No. When they no. smell blood in the water, they're going to fucking go for it. And that's why they just got Max Scherzer. And that's why they just got Jordan Montgomery. And like they were willing to part with an Acuna. When blood is in the water, you have to go find the fish that's bleeding. And, and I think that's what Baltimore needs to do right now. I think you're spot on. Cincinnati fell ass backwards into every rookie performing well yes. beyond expectations. Yes, They are ahead of schedule. Yes. The Baltimore Orioles, Gunnar Henderson stunk, and they were second in the American League East. Gunnar Henderson gets great. They are the leaders in the American League East. Tampa is free-falling right now. Grab this thing by the balls and go for it. Yeah. So if you tell okay. me, hey, I can add Dylan Cease for the next two years, I'm going to go do that. Yeah, but but no, Judd Fabian. Like, who cares? Who cares? Like, and, and here's the thing, man. They have – the best situation in baseball and it's not close they have they have the best record in the american league yeah i think they do uh in the american league yes they do okay baltimore's got the best record of the american league we've talked about this a lot i think they have double the system of the next best team in baseball the system is that good you know if, if it's not if double you, if you are technically not graduating you know like westberg and and Kowser. Kowser, i i'm with you yeah, I mean, it's it's a definitely a full tier above, and and that's the thing. Like the last thing I'll say on this is, this team they rake, and that's a big part of it. The other big part of it is the bullpen, and the bullpens one like bullpens are volatile as hell. What if the bullpen's not as? What if Felix Bautista falls on his face next year? Like that happens all the time. It happens all like, the time. And your canoes come out of nowhere. Like, is he going to do it again next year? It may probably, but I'm not sure. I, I just think you can't take for granted having the best record in the American League, like you said, and saying, "Oh, but you know, we weren't supposed to be here right now." Okay, make but it, you're here. Yeah, go. Like, get rid <laughs> like, of the go. imposter syndrome. Go rip yeah. it, dog. Yeah, like, I don't know. That's, I think... that's where that's where I'm frustrated because it's like you you don't know what next year looks like for better and for worse. So I think you have this insane cocktail of best team in the American league and best system in baseball. Go make the best team in the American league, arguably the most talented team in baseball. And it's going to be hard to catch Atlanta, especially with Freed coming back, but go make them arguably the best team in baseball while still retaining your title of best system in baseball or drop to two or three when it comes to best yeah. farm and, system in baseball. And the last thing I'll say is, I get it. Like I, I wouldn't want to go rental, you know, you know, I, I understand that perspective though. I would probably still go snag a rental, you know, maybe you don't overpay like crazy, but Erod, like I'd be willing to give up a, a slight overpay for that because my system's so good. The Orioles can legitimately make it impossible for Rick Hahn to hang up the phone. And, you know, maybe they should just do that. <laughs> You don't have to trade Jackson Holiday to do so. I understand not trading Jackson Holiday, the clear number one prospect in baseball. I don't even think you but need to you, trade Kerstad to do so. No, Mayo and other pieces could get it done pretty easily, I think, and and you could have a really nice situation for the not only this year, like not only does he give you the chance. I mean, it sees. I, I'll be nervous when I give him the ball game one, but he's got a shot to to win us game one. But not only that, you can try to help get him back to where he was last year for the next two years. You have your ace. No brainer for me. I'd, I'd give up a really, really nauseating haul for Dylan Cease if I was in the Orioles position because it still wouldn't set you back. We talk about sustainable success, like like Dana Brown said, you're, you're still set up for sustainable success. Yes. Yes. Um, let's wrap with Ethan Salas, the 17-year-old. Mm -hmm in the Padres system who has now played 43 games stateside in low A with Lake Elsinore. Ethan Salas should like still be in the Dominican summer league, yeah. but he's in low A and he's slashing 292, 380, 532. That's a 912 OPS in 43 games, 10 doubles, nine homers, 35 driven in, in 43 games. He just turned 
17 years old. Yeah. You're is this guy, just... is he a top five prospect in baseball? Yeah. The top 100 updates coming out and every game I watch, he slides up more and more and more. I, Ethan Salas, you know, we're obviously going to talk about him a lot on the call up, but this is a baseball story. This is a major league baseball story. This is a, this is something that is just a fascinating uh, spectacle on, on every lens. He started the year 16 years old in low A. That is unheard of. You, you don't even see guys playing the DSL at 16. Like yeah. they, they keep them on the backfields and just kind of let them, let them develop. Like we're going to teach you how to catch, catch now. We're yeah. going to teach play, you how to throw now. <laughs> yeah. Play catch. And then they're, they're doing their times tables, you know, at the Academy yeah. afterwards. Like I'm not even kidding. Um, Salas in his last 25 games in low a he's hitting, on, he has eight home runs and 17 extra base hits with a 1,002 1.002 OPS in 25 low A games as a kid that just turned 17 contact rates are well above average to plus exit velocities are slightly above average. And his chase rate is a minuscule minuscule. So this dude is ahead of his years, polish wise already extremely like talented in terms of just what he, what he has tools wise. I don't know. Someone responded Jack and was like, have we, you know, what would you compare this to in terms of how advanced a prospect is Wander Franco? Wander Franco did this did this in rookie ball, but he could have done it in full season ball. I think when Wander Franco was 17, I believe he put up video game numbers with like a 7% K rate of rookie ball, if I'm not mistaken. I know you can pull that up. I think it was 70. I think it was 7% strikeout rate as a 17 year old in rookie ball with like a ridiculous slash line. Yeah. So rookie ball is a 17 year old, 61 games slashed 351, 418, 587. That's a 1004 OPS with 11 yeah. pumps. And 19, 19 punches in 273 plate appearances. What was the strikeout rate? Are young fan graphs are in reference? Uh, baseball reference. I was um, curious if I got the strikeout rate right. I'll um, I'll go to I'll go to fan graphs right now. But I mean, like that's probably adjacent, right? Like that's probably you know I think you put him in low A and like Elsinore, he probably puts up similar numbers. Like it's yeah. it's Wander level, it's Soto level, for, Harper level. And I'm not saying he's going to become those players. But it's that level of ridiculous polish at at a teenage. Okay, what do you think it was? I said seven percent. Seven percent. You're so weird, bro. Nice. Uh, what do you think it was in low A? Eighteen years old. Fourteen. Seven point four. <laughs> Jesus Christ! Yeah, Dude, so he would have done the same thing. I'm going to give you the age and the WRC plus by stop for Wander Franco, which is just so funny to think about. 2018, 17-year-old in rookie ball, 159 WRC+. Plus. 2019, 18-year-old in low A, 155 WRC+. Plus. 2019, he was still 18 years old in high A, 157 WRC+. Plus. 20-year-old in triple and 21, 150 WRC+. Plus. Well, Wander Franco is like never before seen, but the closest thing we've got is this catching prospect for the Padres, Ethan Salas. And that because the fucked up thing is he's he's a catcher. Yeah. <laughs> like he's catching. And he's a good one. He yeah. caught in big league spring training at 16 years old and he didn't look out of place. He's throwing out 30% of runners. The pass balls are a little bit of an issue because he's legitimately learning how to drive a car when he's not playing. Like he, he's gonna be fine. Um it's it's remarkable stuff. I just wanted to highlight him. So I'm glad you brought that up and uh yeah, he's going to probably be a number one prospect in baseball by the time he debuts. Yeah, had to be. All right, uh, that's Arm. I'm Jack. Sorry, he's Arm. Arm's him. I'm Jack. Uh, just baseball. So happy August. Happy deadlining again this afternoon, five to six. Wherever you ingest just baseball video wise, um, recommend YouTube, and you'll find us on Twitter as well, um, Twitch as well deadline special type thing from five to six o'clock we're talking uh up until the buzzer about everything that goes down for the mlb trade deadline so we'll talk to you guys uh the podcast version tomorrow